Hello, and welcome to the first lecture in the machine learning course at the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. In this lecture, we'll look at the basic principles that define machine learning, and in this first video, we'll start with the obvious question, what is machine learning? To illustrate, we'll start with a simple example. In the 1990s, the US Postal Service processed billions of letters each day, and many of them had handwritten addresses like this one. So clearly, sorting out these letters is a process where we could use some automation. And to sort letters at the highest level, we need to look at the zip code, a set of five digits written at the bottom uh, right of the address. So to automate this, the main question is how do we teach computers to read digits? This is pretty easy for us. Almost all humans can do it. But the problem is that this is one of those tasks that humans know how to do without knowing how it is that we do it. We can, read, we can all read these digits, but if we met somebody who couldn't, we wouldn't be able to explain to them exactly what steps it is that we follow when we read one of these digits. We might say something like a 2 is always a continuous line with no loops, or with a curve at the top and a corner in the bottom left, but that doesn't tell us how we recognize a line, a corner and a curve in the first place. And it also doesn't tell us why in this particular zip code we recognize the second digit as a 2, even though it doesn't follow these rules. In short, even if we have some idea of what we're doing, we can make the process precise enough to turn it into an algorithm so that we can implement it in a computer. So if we can't explain this to other people, how did we learn it in the first place? Apparently nobody explained it to us in these terms, and clearly we weren't born with it. The answer, of course, is that we learn. We are given a large number of examples by some teacher, or in this case, a television program, and from that we infer the general rules without ever making them explicit. Machine learning studies the question of putting this process into a computer. Instead of providing a set of instructions to follow step by step as we normally do in programming, we want to figure out some way in which we can give the computer a large number of examples so that the computer can figure out its own program without us having to explicitly state what the program is. Before we dive into exactly how this works, let's look at some more examples of where this might be useful. Our first example is playing chess. In this case, we don't actually need machine learning. We happen to understand chess well enough that we can design a program that learns nothing, it simply follows instructions, and it's still good enough to beat the best grandmaster. In this picture we see, in fact, just that happening. Deep Blue, a system using no machine learning, is playing and defeating the then world champion Garry Kasparov in 1997. However, even if we can build a purely rule-based program that can play chess very well, it doesn't play chess in the same way as humans do. And we do have a lot of examples of how humans play chess, so we could build a computer program that learns to play chess from humans. And in fact, this was one of the important steps towards building the current generation of best chess playing uh, programs, which we'll look at later in the course. Another example is self-driving cars. A lot of people know how to drive a car, and a large number of aspects of driving a car can be made explicit, but not all of it. We don't know how we recognize traffic signs, we don't know how we recognize pedestrians, and we don't know how to follow the road. And many of these problems can be isolated, and in isolation we can see if we can learn them from examples. Of course, once we do that, we then have to integrate them successfully into a larger system. And that's very much an open problem in itself. So let's zoom out a bit. In general, what makes a suitable ML problem? These are some general uh, guidelines. They are usually problems that we cannot solve explicitly. We don't know the program that solves it. We can live with approximate solutions. So even if we cannot perfectly recognize all digits on an envelope all the time, if we do so 99%, we can still take that learning solution and put it into a useful system. Machine learning systems, compared to traditional software, have limited reliability, predictability, and interpretability, so we should only use them in settings where this is fine. And of course, if we're going to learn, we need to have plenty of examples available to learn from. So here are some examples of good and bad problem settings for machine learning. Computing taxes, for instance. That's a case where, firstly, we know the exact algorithm, so we can actually implement the rules and just compute them. So there's no need to learn them. And also, approximate solutions and limited reliability are not fine here. We need 
taxes to be computed exactly, all the time, perfectly, and we need them to be interpretable. If we get a computation for our taxes, we need to know where it came from. And that's something that machine learning also doesn't always give us. Clinical decisions are another important example. For instance, a diagnosis by a doctor. This is something where machine learning can help, but ultimately it's a very important decision. So approximate solutions are not fine. And limited reliability is not fine. What we can use machine learning for is clinical decision support. We can use machine learning to build tools to make suggestions for doctors, to suggest causes behind symptoms that they may simply not have thought of. But ultimately we need to put the responsibility in the hands of the clinician and not in the hands of the ML system because of this limited reliability and the fact that it gives us approximate solutions. Where do we use ML? Once we have ML systems, where do they tend to get deployed? Probably most often these days inside other software. So there's no there's no software or almost no software that is entirely based on machine learning. What usually happens is that we build a small module that makes predictions and those predictions are then used in a traditional software setting. For instance, if you want to unlock your phone with your face, as is a common feature these days, we build a small module that does face recognition for us that tells us, I think with 99.9% .9 certainty, that this user is currently looking at the phone and that uh, prediction is passed off to the rest of the security system which is built using traditional software tools. That's not the only setting. We can also use software in analytics or data mining or data science. So for instance, if you have a large website with a lot of visitors, you can um, look for patterns in your traffic to see how you can optimize to see at what times uh, you need to provide the biggest capacity and that sort of thing. You can analyze your business data using machine learning, data mining, and data science techniques, all of which we will discuss in this course. And finally, we can use machine learning in science and statistics. And in this, in this case, it's not so much the model that is, that is of interest to us, but the fact that there exists a model that allows us to predict A from B. Because if that's the case, and the relation is not spurious, then there must be some relation between A and B, which we can then investigate further. So, now that we've seen some examples and some outlines, let's see if we can pin down a definition for machine learning. Here's one I found online. Machine learning provides systems the ability to automatically learn and improve from experience without being explicitly programmed. And I've highlighted first the word system. We're talking about a large integrated system which learns from experience and which is not being explicitly programmed. So if you take this definition literally, it sort of implies the kind of system that we are as humans, a, a system that is continuously experiencing things and then using those experiences to integrate into its mental model of the world, updating its mental model, and then making decisions based on all of the experience up to that point. And there are indeed machine learning uh, systems that behave in this way. Uh, the closest thing to this is what we call the framework of reinforcement learning, which is a way to model systems that take actions in a world based on delayed feedback. So we have a system, it exists in a world, it takes actions, the actions move it from state to state, and based on its current state, it gets a reward, and its job is to maximize that reward. This is a very powerful framework, and we'll talk about this in the 13th lecture. But in general, it's very complicated to have to model all of this. So for most cases, it suffices to simplify this a lot. So one way to simplify this is to take out the actions, to say we're just predicting. So we're predicting and learning at the same time. We're constantly observing the world. Observations are coming in, and we are updating our current predictions for what's going to happen next constantly. That's called online learning. Uh, this is something we'll not be discussing in this course, but you might run into it in later courses. But for the bulk of this course, what we're going to be looking at is offline learning, which is a much simplified view of learning that still maintains the, the most important and interesting parts of the learning task. And the main idea behind offline learning is that we separate learning, predicting, and acting. 
So we start with a fixed data set of examples. These are called instances. And these examples describe the sort of thing we want our machine learning model to learn. We feed all of them to a learning algorithm, which produces a model. And at that point, the learning is done. We have the model and we can discard the data. And that's when we start predicting. Then we test the model to see if it works by checking its predictions. And then if it works, we put it into production, i.e. we build it into a phone to recognize faces or into a mail sorting system to help us recognize digits. But what we've got rid of is this online element where we are learning and predicting at the same time. We learn once and then we have a model and then we look at how good that model is. And for most of the course, we will do this kind of offline learning. And this robs the exercise of some of its more exciting aspects because we don't have this view of an agent exploring a world anymore. But it still allows us to do something very useful. Namely, it allows us to learn programs that we have no idea how to write ourselves. And that's really what machine learning is all about. Now, we've talked about a lot of problems for which machine learning would be suitable. But what we want is not to find a solution for each and every one of them individually in isolation. What we want is to find generic solutions. We don't want to spend years developing a chess playing engine and then find that all the methods we've developed are no use for anything other than playing chess. So what we do in machine learning is we abstract the learning task to an abstract task. These have names like classification, regression, clustering, density estimation, and so on. And then we develop algorithms for these abstract tasks. So then when you want to apply machine learning, what you have to do is take your problem and translate it to an abstract task. And then you can take any algorithm that already exists off the shelf and apply it to the abstract task. And if you're a machine learning researcher developing new algorithms, you can focus directly on this abstract task without having to worry too much about the specific details of how movie recommendation or car driving works. And we'll look at these abstract tasks uh, in more detail in the rest of the lecture. The first thing we can do is divide the abstract tasks in supervised and unsupervised ones. Supervised tasks are those where explicit examples of both input and output are provided. So we get a picture of a digit and which digit it's supposed to be. And then the task is to given an input to learn to predict the output. And unsupervised tasks, we are provided only with inputs and the task is to find any pattern that explains something about the data. And we'll look first at the supervised tasks. And there are two main ones called classification and regression. In classification, we assign a class to each example, which is one of a small number of categories, such as, for instance, the 10 digits. And in regression, the task is to assign a number to each example. And we'll look at classification in more detail in the next video. But for now, here is a historical video to show you how it was done a few decades ago. In the 1950s and 60s, scientists built a few working perceptrons, as these artificial brains were called. He's using it to explore the mysterious problem of how the brain learns. This perceptron is being trained to recognize the difference between males and females. It is something that all of us can do easily, but few of us can explain how. To get a computer to do this would involve working out many complex rules about faces and writing a computer program. But this perceptron was simply given lots and lots of examples, including some with unusual hairstyles. But when it comes to a beetle, the computer looks at facial features and hair outline and takes longer to learn what it's told by Dr. Taylor. Andrew Cruikshank's wig also causes a little heart searching. After training on lots of examples, it's given new faces it has never seen and is able to successfully distinguish male from female. It has learned. While promising, this approach to machine intelligence virtually died out. And so now that we have some idea of what machine learning is, let's finish up this video by looking at what it isn't. How does machine learning differ from these other closely related fields? And we'll go through each of them individually. First, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And these are often confused in the media. 
And essentially, we can think of machine learning as a subset of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is the general business of building intelligent agents, and sometimes that is done using learning algorithms, and sometimes it isn't. So some tasks that are AI but are not ML are, for instance, automated reasoning and planning. And I used to give playing chess as an example, because uh, Deep Blue, who we saw earlier playing Kasparov, was a system that used no machine learning whatsoever. However, at the moment, the best automated chess playing system does use machine learning. So this is a task that can be solved both with and without machine learning. Another field that is popular is data science. This is the general business of looking at data and making inferences, dealing with data, pre-processing data, making inferences and learning from it. And again, machine learning is mostly a subset of data science. Almost everything we do in machine learning counts as data science, but not everything we do in data science counts as machine learning. So tasks that are data science but not machine learning are, for instance, the business of gather gathering data, harmonizing data, pre-processing it, and interpreting data. Another phrase you may have heard is data mining. This is very closely related to machine learning, so much so that they are almost the same field, and the best way to represent them is probably as uh, this intersection Venn diagram. So it's very difficult to tell exactly where data mining begins and where machine learning ends, but in general I would say data mining focuses more on a given large uh, database of data and finding patterns within it, such as done in, in data analytics in, in large companies, and machine learning focuses more on prediction tasks and understanding. Uh, and machine learning tends to focus more on the task than on the data itself. So how do we learn to classify spam? How do we learn to control a robot? And the question of where the data comes from is, the, is more of an afterthought than a given. So things like finding common click streams in web logs or finding fraud in transaction networks is generally a little bit more data mining than machine learning. And things like spam classification, stock prices, and learning to control a robot is more machine learning than data mining. But in general, the two are very closely related, and it's not always easy to say which is which. For other fields, the distinction is more clear. For instance, something like information retrieval, the business of building search engines. This is very distinct from machine learning, but it may surprise you to know that there is actually some overlap. For instance, the task of finding those documents that are relevant for a particular query can actually be cast as a classification problem, and as such, the field can benefit from methods that are developed in machine learning, and vice versa. Some methods that are developed for information retrieval can benefit what we do in machine learning. Another field with large overlap with machine learning is statistics. In fact, many of the methods and terminology we use in machine learning existed long before the phrase machine learning was ever invented, and most of them are inherited from statistics. Both fields deal with the business of fitting models to data, and the main difference comes from what we want from the model once it's fitted. In general, in statistics, we are looking to find a model that not only fits the data well, but also matches reality. In some sense, the model needs to do what actually happened to produce the data and needs to help us explain that. So for instance, when we're analyzing research results or dealing with courtroom evidence, these statistics will tell us, so we hope, what actually happens. Whereas in machine learning, when we, do, when we deal with something like spam classification or movie recommendation, we really are only interested in providing predictions that are likely to be accurate. And we don't care that much whether the machine learning model actually follows the causal relations that led to the data in the first place. And finally, another phrase you may have heard a lot recently is that of deep learning. And here we can be clear, deep learning is a subset of machine learning. It's a set of particular machine learning techniques that happen to be very popular and very effective recently. And we will discuss these techniques starting in lecture six. But there are many other techniques in machine learning that are not deep learning. So there we have it, machine learning. Hopefully after this video you have some idea of what we mean when we say machine learning. And in the next videos in this lecture we'll dig a little deeper into these specific abstract tasks. Starting in the next video with the abstract task of classification.